Integrating all people through sports is the mission of World Team Sports. Our nonprofit organization believes that people with disabilities can adapt, excel, and participate alongside people without disabilities, given the right training, events, and attitude. World Team Sports' first project, AXA World Ride 95, has demonstrated that this attitude is contagious as communities around the world have been connected and impacted. There is no looking back. This project would not have been possible without the enthusiasm and financial backing of our committed sponsors. dream. Hello, I'm Charles Carroll. The world is always saying to us, this thing you want to do is impossible. You can't do that. Certain human beings always answer, yes, I can. If things go as planned, a handful of such men and women will be arriving here in Washington in a little while to celebrate an accomplishment most people would have said was impossible. This is a Thanksgiving story not quite like any other. What we're giving thanks for is nothing less than the human spirit. World Ride, The Possible Dream, sponsored by AXA Insurance and Investment. There is great power in an idea. The idea is to create a team, a world team, featuring disabled cyclists, and to ride around the world. I reach out with my open hand I reach out with my heart I've been waiting, oh Lord, I've been praying For the journey to start Seven Americans, six of them disabled, are chosen from hundreds of applicants to be the core team that will attempt to do it all. They're out to show the world that disabilities don't matter. Ability matters. I I've learned how to fly. Oh, I have learned how to fly. It's so easy to leave all my troubles behind. Because I fly. Oh, I have learned how to fly. From Atlanta on St. Patrick's Day, the ride will cover 13,000 miles, 16 countries, 247 days. The riders hope to finish just before Thanksgiving in Washington, D.C. The idea might strike you as absurd. When Steve Ackerman heard the idea, he grasped it to his heart. So when I got this letter in June saying, would you be interested in taking a stage of this ride? You know, the light went on. I said, this, this has got me written all over it. This is what, you know, my heart started pounding. I said, this is what I got to do. Eight years ago, Steve decided to go skiing despite a heavy snowstorm. He was a concert promoter, a runner, the father of two young children. His car skidded off the road. The doctor pronounced his sentence. You'll never walk again. Uh, I was thinking maybe life would not really be all that much worth living. Uh, my wife came in and brought in pictures of the kids and said, uh, kind of a selfish thought. And then uh, I realized that I needed to think about the things that I could do instead of the things I couldn't do. Steve is paralyzed below his chest. He is the most seriously disabled person on the core team, and among the most determined to do something that's never been done before, hand cycle around the world. Rory McCarthy is an electrical engineer. He's already hand cycled across the United States from the state of Washington to his home state of Maine. David Cornelson, in his trademark red helmet, hopes to add hand cycling around the world to his list of other achievements. PhD, social worker, professor, Yale Divinity student, actor, holder of many hand cycling records. He's keeping a journal of the trip. Day one, March 17th. Atlanta to Athens, Georgia, 74 miles. 
After all the hoopla, we finally get to ride. The team is set. Ron, our chief mechanic, will ride anchor in the back, hopping off to help every time somebody has a flat, and then sprinting to catch up to the group. Rex is sort of a free spirit from Colorado. Kathy, our only able-bodied person, and Agnes are the two women in the core group. And me, Rory, and Steve seem to get most of the attention because of our hand cycles. Our boss is Paul Curley, a former professional bike racer from New England. He seems to have a military kind of an approach to the job, which is probably what it'll take to get us all the way around the world safely. Be careful and good luck. World Ride offers an open invitation to ride along, and on the first day, hundreds take part. These cyclists are riding for anywhere from a few miles to a few hundred. The core team of seven riders will keep on going, riding nearly every day for the next eight months. Rex Patrick knows there are no guarantees. I mean, I'm confident of my cycling ability, and yeah. I know how strong I am. Sure. But anything can happen. I've learned that the hard way. My father was a drunk, and his father was a drunk before him, and his father before him. My mother was a drug addict, and her father was a drunk, and I thought that this was my destiny. When he was 18, that destiny cost him his left leg in a drunk driving accident. Ten years later, he discovered cycling. Sitting on my roommate's front porch one day, and he had this old clunker of a bike sitting out there. It was a Huffy. It weighed 100 pounds. And he looked at me, and he said, you know, I think you can ride this bike. It never even crossed my mind to ride a bicycle. And he put me on it. And I laughed at him. I said, there's no way I can do this. And he took a piece of rope, and he tied my foot to the pedal. And we never thought about what was going to happen when I had to stop. I'm tied to this bike, and he pushes me out of the driveway, and I go. And I got this smile on my face because I knew that I'd found something new that I could do. And it lasted for about 30 seconds, and I came to a stop sign and did the big crunch, you know, blood, both elbows. And, but I got up, and I said, we got to go to the bike shop. And we went to the bike shop, we got a toe clip, and I rode everywhere I went. Rex is now a drug and alcohol prevention counselor and a three-time national cycling champion. If you're going to film me, I'm going to draft off of you. I'm suffering back here. What did you do, Andy? The heavy mileage is compounded by unexpected dissension. Rex yearns to ride at his own pace. Tour director Paul Curley decides that the team should ride together in a single pack for safety. Rex feels strongly this wasn't what he agreed to, and he raises the issue in a team meeting. Two months ago when we talked on the phone and you said to me, am I gonna lose fitness on this ride? And I said, no, you know, we're gonna try to accommodate you. I don't think I understood the full aspect of the ride at that time. I don't think I was well enough informed. I don't think I had enough experience with hand cyclists, you know, with, with other kinds of dis disabilities. Um, and it was hard for me to say that, you know, a lot of this ride, I'm going to have to hold you back. And you're going to have to be very patient. We've been talking about it. And if I have to be vocal, I'll be vocal. April 5th, day 16. Mystic to Providence, 74 miles. Wind chill of 12 below, character building miserable, but the first signs of our group beginning to function as a team. Kathy Rosick is the least experienced of the core riders, and today she learned to ride a pace line. That I just felt really cool. I was riding with all you guys the other day, and it was just like, but it was that morning that I rode with, um, with Ron and with Agnes, and in particular with Rex and his help and, and some of the other people. And that was the, the first time I had ever done that, and it was fantastic. OK, Kathy, here you go. Now slow up. There you go. Keep your pedal speed up. Yeah. Then to 
make a quick surge is a lot easier and a lot more, a lot quicker. It was great. You made me feel more able than I had ever been. <laughs> it was great. On April 6th, World Ride arrives in Boston. From here, the team members will fly to Ireland. It will be nearly six months before they return to the United States. Some of them suddenly realize six months is a long time. Cycling around the world doesn't include the oceans. The riders take a plane from Boston to Ireland. There, they confront the realities of moving a group of disabled people around the world. I think it's a lot harder than I expected. The physical part of it is the easy part, and when people think about riding their bicycles around the world, they think physically it's a hard thing. But the amount of organization that goes into every day is really that's what's been close to overwhelming at times. It's time to reassemble the bikes. Back home in Virginia, this is what Ron Irvine does for a living. Here, it's just something to do when he's not riding. Ron has a prosthetic for a left foot, the result of an auto accident. But he believes in pushing himself as hard as he can. I think I'm happiest when uh, I really have something hard coming along, some goal. Yeah. Um, I need to keep setting goals. And this is definitely a sport that you know, you can go to your limit and maybe a little beyond and suffer a little. And uh, that's that's what it's about, you know. Life is too easy um, at times, so you need to push and find that limit. Yeah. Well, it's a name you'll find a lot here. <laughs> we have. Yeah. Rory McCarthy is a cheerful sort, even though a muscular atrophy in his leg struck him at an early age. He had body casts, 22 leg operations, and crutches that came at the age of 16 and never went away. The physical suffering was easier to deal with than the blow to his image of himself. And here I was, 16 years old, and trying to uh, get interested, you know, and in, involved with friends and social activities and... And girls. Girls. Oh, girls. oh man. <laughs> girls were so hard because I, I just felt like I, I couldn't do and I couldn't participate in things. I was very afraid to become seriously involved with a woman because I felt like I wasn't a whole person. I didn't think about getting married because I never thought that that would happen. And I know that will happen. And it's just a matter of time, and and I'm sure I'm going to meet her along the trip. <laughs> hey, there's been five possibilities so far. That's right. That's right. World Ride was a dream of Jim Benson's, a business executive who spent four years turning it into a reality. When Jim joined the ride, Steve Ackerman questioned his motivations. Why, uh, why are we doing this? What's, uh... <laughs> Why are we doing this? What, what really, well, what really, what, what really made us want to do this? Well, without being corny, when I was growing up, hey, hey, Steve, when I was growing up, the most inspirational person in our school was a young man who had congenital, congenital birth defects and was confined to a wheelchair his entire life. He was the smartest kid in our class. He was the funniest kid in our class. He was the most talented person in our class. And I never thought he had a chance to do as much as he could do. So I thought if I was ever able to as an adult, I'd want to arrange and organize things so all people could get out and do things. And that's why we're doing this. Inclusion is the whole point. Everyone is welcome. Some come for a mile and some for a month. At any given time, about 30 stage riders are part of the team, and they make up a long checklist of disabilities. Such a crowd has its own sense of humor. 
One of the questions Rex gets asked all the time is, what do you do with your other shoe? My left foot. He's found an answer. Meet Dan Emosodi. One of the more memorable stage riders is Boleslav Zajacek, known as Bolek. Bolek is 65 years old, speaks no English, and has never been out of Poland before. He lives in the tiny village of Milic, where 45 years ago he lost his hands and wrists when he picked up a tin box in a field. Inside was a live hand grenade. Still, Bolek is totally independent, and his sunny spirit inspires everyone he meets. April 23rd, day 38, Beauvais to Paris, 71 miles. A real milestone despite the dreary weather. More than 2,000 miles down, and we're still on schedule, and the team is going strong. Seeing Europe at 15 miles an hour is the way to go, and our accommodations and support make this trip seem ideal. I am touched by the child that I see Inside every man, including me As a child I dreamt I could fly Now my dreams are coming to life I spread my wings against the sky I have learned how to fly so far, the ride has been incredibly blessed. After all the good weather and the good spirits, I keep wondering when our luck will change. May 13th, day 58. Dresden, Germany to Teplitza, Czech Republic. 65 miles. It rained all day, hard at times, and never stopped. Tempers were flaring, and with every stop, the snarling increased. We ascended from 100 feet in Dresden to over 3,000 feet at the border of the Czech Republic. As we climbed up, the temperatures went down. Damn, it keeps going. At one point, we climbed a 14% grade on wet cobblestone. With each push and pull of the pedals, the hand cycle lurched forward 12 inches and backward 3 inches, the front wheel drive slipping on the cobblestone. Then we began a chilling 9-mile descent. Our brakes melted like butter, so I could only slow my bike down, but not stop. If this is any indication of what's ahead, I don't expect that all of us will make it to Washington. I have this physical obstacle and you can see it, it's right out there. But everybody has obstacles in their lives, everybody has problems or things that are kind of holding them back. Poor rider Agnes Kieran lost the use of her left arm in a motorcycle accident. Back home in Boston Spa, New York, she's a hospital records technician. My son, Sean, is 11. He loves soldiers. I've been buying him soldiers and stuff from um, like London and Paris and Boston. He's quite proud of what I'm doing. He went and spoke to his school, and, and you could just tell that he was really proud that his mom was going around the world, and his mom has been on the TV doing the local news and in the papers. Just the other day when I talked to him, I could feel the sadness, you know, in his voice. <laughs> I know. <laughs> when he said, I miss you, Mom, you know. Yeah, that's hard. Like Rex, Agnes is troubled by the team's need to ride together in a single pack. She yearns to go at her own pace, the kind of cycling she does back home. 
Again, the conflict is between the needs of the individual and the requirements of the team. And if I'm going to be away from my family, if I'm going to be sacrificing, it's got to be because I'm doing something that's important. So I'm thinking about going home. The matter became the subject of a team meeting in Vienna, presided over by Steve Wisman, World Ride's executive director. You know, it'll just be best for me to do my best and go back to racing. You know, I, I don't race at home to, to be the best, but I always do my best. And I've never could have raced, and, and people, they don't care if I'm toward the end, you know? They just cheer me on, because it's amazing that I would even try, you know? I just hate being told, if you try to do your best, you're not a team player. <laughs> I, I guess what I was going to say also, just in the way that, that you, you find the balance, but that you also come to some kind of of peace and enjoyment with all those things that occur off the bicycle? Or how many times have you gone up to someone and said, let's cycle today, because I, th I think I can help you? I never noticed anybody wanting help or needing help. But maybe, oftentimes, no, nobody's going to ask you to do that. But, that's, but I think that's a valuable role for you. It's a valuable role for Rex. It's You've a got a lot more to give than just going fast on a bicycle. May 27th, day 72, Krakow to Kielce, Poland, 68 miles. Agnes's decision to stay seems to have been the right one. She has had a lot more chances to ride hard and seems to be finding more ways to enjoy herself lately. Rex, too. Today he got on a hand cycle just to test himself and damned if he didn't do all 68 miles without any help. No, 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 no. Oh, oh, oh. He says he's going to beat me soon. Not likely, but I love his spirit. Today was another beautiful day marked with a memorable crash. We were cycling in a tight formation all morning without letting up, a brisk pace into the headwind. Suddenly, Bullock's front wheel overlapped and hit Ken's rear wheel, causing Bullock to lose control. I saw some of the crash as it started to my right and sprinted for safety, watching the pile up in my rearview mirror. He's a little bloody, Doc. Bullock up here. Yeah, a lot of people went down. Bullock's hurt the worst. Uh... Ow. He's not saying it. I'm saying it. Ow. He's the most scraped up one of us all. And uh, it's just like, no problem. No problem. Back on the bike. Bleeding. Rory McCarthy tries to learn a little of each new language the ride encounters. Next, Russian. Well, we gotta keep practicing this because we're getting close to the border. Yeah. First, you start off with, you are beautiful. Krasnia, Zinzina. And then you go to, Yatepia, Lublu. And then you finish up with, Pasului Menya. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. <laughs> but. <laughs> You're not my type. <laughs> In Russia, the team expects conditions that will be much rougher. Bad roads, worse food and water. Sometimes in place of hotels, tents by the side of the road. For me, this is where this ride really starts. In a world of change, who can you rely on? Perhaps a company that millions already do. One of the world's largest insurance and investment groups, managing $250 billion in assets, with 50,000 people working hands-on in 23 countries. AXA, with our partner Equitable. Go ahead, you can rely on us. June 2nd, day 78. World Ride enters the former Soviet Union. Now the team is accompanied at all times by four armed escorts, known collectively as Alpha. The Alpha guards are there to protect, but their presence seems ominous at first. Until now, the riders had faced conditions that were more or less as they were back in the States. Now things get more primitive. Entering Russia seems like traveling back in time. 
At the border, the team meets Oleg Gritskevich, who has cycled 300 miles to greet them. He read a two-line blurb in his local paper about World Ride, and that was enough. He had to be part of the team. Now he just showed up on his bike with all his belongings, and he joined the group and was helping out and, and being part of it and constantly asking questions about America and words in English. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's just neat, you know? That's really making a connection. I've stayed with the ride for seven days now, and it is my belief that these people are the best people in the world. They are somewhat crazy in the good sense of the word, and we share. We ride the same road together. Uh, I had the opportunity to room with him in Moscow the last two days that he was with us, and he yelled into me in the bathroom, asked if I needed any help in that. He said, I know what you, what you go through. I feel it. He said that we are all spirits, all human spirits, and they all deserve the same treatment no matter what container they are in. And that has really affected me. June 19, day 95, Vazniki to Nizhny Novgorod, Russia, 66 miles. The road home seems so long when with each passing day, we are pedaling farther rather than closer. Yet my restless spirit feels at peace the more we wander around the world. The road now feels like my home and the other core cool riders as my family. <laughs> Russia now feels like a perfectly natural place to be, and our insular little group sends warmth to the people we meet. The Alpha Guard are now our friends and companions, fully part of the team. Steve's doing great. He's the most physically challenged of all of us. But at the end of the day, when all I want to do is relax and clean up, Steve keeps going. Steve. Keep screaming. I often feel inadequate when I see him draw upon his inner resources, and I feel all dried up inside. He seems to have a reserve tank of energy. That looks like a babushka. My hope is that I can find somebody out there in the middle of Russia or somewhere that's been sitting around with some kind of injury that's made them think they can't leave the house and, and turn it around for them. I can't get, I can't do anything in a wheelchair without the help of others here. Uh, where I live now, you know, I have my own specially equipped vehicle and a cellular telephone and uh, curb cuts and, uh, you know, a lot less architectural barriers. I come and go as I please, and here uh, there's no way I can come and go as I please. It's already been a long day on July 1st when the lightning storm strikes. Paul Curley thinks there's a threat to the riders and orders them into the vans, but Rex Patrick keeps on riding. And, you know, basically the next thing I knew was that one person was down the road still riding. And I said, you know, to my other team leader, I said, did he get the message? They said, yeah, but he doesn't, you know, he doesn't want to pick up. He doesn't feel like it's dangerous. I came to ride, not to sit in the van, Al. I came to ride. It'll have to get a lot worse than this before I get in the van. When he made that decision to ride off on his own, there was a real strong part of me that wanted to ride off with him. Paul, oh, Rex is coming into the lot. Then there was the other more practical part of me that said, like, you know, okay, hold your horses. Uh, there's thunder and lightning, there's rain, you're tired. Uh, really, what is the point? What am I trying to prove? Let me ask you one question. Why did you continue to ride when everybody else rode? I came to ride my bike around the world. And as far as I'm concerned, there are no vans to get into to shuttle. That's not 
I mean, if we want to sit and wait for the rain to quit, that's one thing, but I'm not going to get in the van and ride. We are a team, and a team has to have a coach or a captain. And uh, when, a, when a, a, a team captain makes a decision, uh, it's not a democratic process where we sit down and we debate and take a vote well, who's going to go on and who's going to do what. We, we, we do what our, our captain or our coach is, says we're to do. I'm going to ride every mile so they can send me home. I don't think the ride has turned out to be what Rex envisioned it to be. And I don't think the ride is something Rex wants to do bad enough to change what he envisioned happening into what this has turned into, you know, to make those sacrifices, you know, that a lot of, a lot of us have had to make. I, I feel like I'm as committed to this ride as anybody else is. But if that means I gotta sell out and not stand up for what I believe in, then yeah, send me home. I've made the decision as the person on the road that's in charge that Rex needs to go off the ride. Um, and this was, you know, a series of things that finished yesterday when he rode off into the lightning storm when we had made a decision that we were gonna evacuate. That same day, the team moves on, now with six core riders. There's no time in the schedule for long farewells. I would never have guaranteed that we were going to have a 100% finish rate. And I still don't guarantee that the six core riders we have now will make it to Washington. There's just too many things that can happen. On July 5th, the van known as the Red Caboose is totaled. Sergei Berezhny, the ride's Russian translator, had been driving it alone when he hit a series of bumps that dumped him off the elevated road and rolled the van twice. To the riders, once disabled themselves in car accidents, the extent of the damage is upsetting. <laughs> Sergei has suffered a serious spinal cord injury that will require fusion surgery to put him on his feet again. Most important thing was that the first exam that we did, everything was okay. First time we checked, all the nerves were working fine. Sergey is a friend a part of the World Ride family. The incident reminds all the riders of their own vulnerability. <laughs> Several days later, the group celebrates a landmark. They cross the halfway point in their journey. Okay, <laughs> halfway to Washington. July 31st, day 134, somewhere in Siberia, 74 miles. Yet another day of the Siberian dreamscape, wide open fields and marshlands with occasional stands of birch breaking up the repetitiveness. It seems like we are passing the same scenes over and over again. Maybe Columbus was wrong. Maybe the earth is flat. Maybe we'll never get back home. Russia is as hospitable as it possibly could be. The Alpha Guards are no longer strangers simply called Nikolai, Dmitri, Alexander, and Eugene. Now they are the Big Cheese, Demi, Papa, and Sasha, four huge guys with the hearts of teddy bears. 
All the Russian people are warm, kind, and generous to a fault. The farther we go from home, the warmer our reception. The image I had of traveling into the heart of darkness couldn't have been more wrong. This is a passage full of light. The people's hearts have been opened, and their generosity has transformed us into beacons of light. Near the shores of Lake Baikal, the ride confronts the Kamar Devan Mountains in 96 degree heat. Uh, 3,040 feet of climbing so far today. So I could, uh, I had to keep on going because the son of a gun, Rory, was right behind me the whole time, always in my sights. So I got to hand it to him. He's coming a long way in this hill climbing, pissing me off. <laughs> uh. well, I hope it gets easier soon. <laughs> After 10 hours, Paul Curley decides the stage riders have had enough and orders them driven to the hotel. One more big hill. Yeah. The core team keeps riding. They cycle the last 30 miles and finish the day by themselves. Just coming in as a group, it was, it was just nice for us to get at our own pace. We were clicking off the mileage a lot faster and, and talking amongst ourselves better than usual. I mean, it was, it was just good to hear uh, everyone relax and happy being around each other. I, I really felt like we were um, a hard hardcore team of um, um, athletes, um, that were called to do something a little bit special and, and that we could rise to the occasion 
and we did it fine. Oh, Papa. It seems almost inconceivable to the riders, but after 4,000 miles and nearly three months in Russia, they have reached Russia's eastern frontier. Thank you. I'm gonna miss you guys. Huh? Oh, Miami, Miami, Miami Beach. Me and Nikolai. Big party in Miami Good Beach. Luck. See you in Miami. <laughs> So what's it going to be like on the other yeah. side? They're going to let us right in? Uh, yeah, yeah, because I, I gave them... Yeah. Hard to believe we're leaving this place, but it's a lot. Ahead lies Mongolia, with 500 miles of unpaved roads and the Gobi Desert. Call it strength. One of the world's largest insurance and investment groups. Call it trust. $250 billion in assets under management. Call it global. 50,000 people working hands-on in 23 countries. Call it vision. Give clients an even better chance in a changing world. Call it AXA with our partner Equitable. Go ahead. You can rely on us. Mongolia, the most exotic country on the World Ride itinerary. A place where centuries of history are reflected in the people and the customs. Where mare's milk is the refreshment of choice. That's the mare's milk. It's a good luck gesture. Thank you. Beautiful day. Beautiful day. A fellow and a young fellow on a horse comes running up and he's his trail crossed ours uh, in the middle of the, the big open plain back here. And uh, John Barr, our translator, was talking to him, discovered he was on his way to a wedding of a friend, you know. He had another 40 kilometers to go on his horse, and all of a sudden he raced off and took off across the, the prairie uh, heading to a friend's wedding. And I, it was just incredible to, to be experiencing that out here. Except for the landmarks we're going by, like the railroad that goes across here, the, um, the people are just straight out uh, you know, two centuries ago. After five months, everybody on the trip has an indispensable role. Team leader Ken Snelling has to find enough food to feed 30 hungry people. Wow, that's a good store. That open. Hello. Kathy and Agnes are now the Gobi twins, even though the ride hasn't reached the desert yet. Kathy has a talent for keeping spirits up and for finding amusing diversions where they seem impossible to find. Okay, copy that. We'll see you uh, in a little bit. We're just taking a little Mongolian tea break for the afternoon. I'm going to take a little. Well, it's a new definition of civilization. I think she needs to hold the flag with the Washington, D.C. Okay, guys, we probably should back up. Okay. Ah, dear the Thank you very much. Right on. Agnes is no longer frustrated and homesick. She's been transformed by the stark conditions. Now she's a constant source of help. It feels much more remote. In Siberia, you saw a lot more towns. This is, I mean, you just look anywhere and you see nothing but rolling hills and grass and the sky is huge because it's just so flat and goes on forever. It's a place for a restless spirit, a place for David Cornelson. David used to be a rock climber, a hiker, a marathoner, an adventurer. On his way to go water skiing in Mexico, he slouched down and fell asleep in the back seat of his friend's car. His seatbelt crept up about six inches, just below his rib cage. When the car had a head-on collision, the seatbelt snapped his back right there, the third lumbar vertebra. 
you really begin to, to think of what kind of what, what the future is going to be like for you. If there's going to be any quality to your life at all. And I made a pact with myself between three and four weeks after my injury that uh, I give myself a year to live as a paraplegic. After one year's time, I would reassess whether life was worth living, and suicide would be an option. That was eight years ago. David no longer thinks of suicide. He is riding his hand cycle across Mongolia on his way around the world, fulfilling a dream he had when he was able-bodied. For anybody, this would be the adventure of a lifetime. Slowly, surely, the team covers the miles and approaches the Gobi. The roads are no more than tracks in the rocky terrain. Tires go flat every few miles, which makes Ron Irvine a very busy man. That was two days' worth of tubes, look to you, of things that we've had in just two days. What was the time on change that time? Five minutes, 38 seconds. Hey, Ron, how are we doing back there? Can't... We're rolling. Over. Day 166, August 29th. Sane San Mongolia, 58 miles. A rare moment to reflect. If adventure is defined as the most adverse of circumstances, this is the essence of it. Still, the core team is so conditioned, both mentally and physically, that we do not relate to this as high adventure. This is just normal. Tonight we have a rare treat, abundant water, an unsolicited gift from some local Mongolians. For the first time in a week, we can do laundry and take showers for as long as we want. Here, simple amenities seem like profound gifts. The beauty of the stark and barren land is astonishing. This is the reward for the brutal cycling, certainly the most difficult I've ever done. And yet, we still haven't reached the Gobi Desert, which promises to be hotter and drier and sandier still. World Ride, the possible dream, sponsored by AXA Insurance and Investment, will return. The Gobi Desert. After 170 days, World Ride enters the hardest part of the trip. It's hot riding, <laughs> and it's hard riding. Uh, the sand just sucks your wheel and throws you off. <laughs> it's, it's, been hard. it's been a lot, a lot of work. They said exotic. This is tough terrain. All the sand we're slipping around in and, uh, you know, fighting the sand traps. It's hot out here. You know, gosh, it's 95 degrees. There's, there's lots of places where the, uh, the road surface is so soft and full of sand that it's just impossible to, uh, to pedal the hand cycle through it. Is this the hardest part of the trek? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's the most trying just because the, uh, the uh, sand and the elements. And, but riding through sand is just very, very difficult. It's hard going downhill. Nobody has ever ridden a hand cycle through the Gobi Desert before. It was uh, going pretty good uh, for a while, and uh, now I'm kind of lost my energy. I'm not sure. I'm sure it's chemical. I'm sure it's chemical. My uh, my uh, back starts tightening up. My legs start tightening up, and then it seems like I'm using a lot of energy down there. But I, I can't feel it, so I don't know. You know what's what's going on. But it seems to seems like my lower body saps me. Is sapping me a little bit. Okay, everybody huddle up for a second. We are 25K total to the border. You guys conquered the Gobi! Thank you. I'll show you. I want to... Paved roads. After struggling through the Gobi, the riders fear that they are simply a mirage. 
In truth, they have reached China. Ahead are hotels, running water, and plenty of good food. China is still a long way from home, but it's a welcome change. Entering China through the back door of Mongolia means that the ride is seeing another remote part of the world. This is an area not normally open to tourists, so two dozen foreign cyclists in bright yellow shirts bring people running. After nearly six months on the road, this is an affirmation. The mission is working. This is why they came. China is the land of bicycles, and yet the ride is mobbed by curious onlookers. Everywhere the team goes, people are waiting. Everything the team does makes people stare. through these little villages and seeing all these faces of the, of the you know, Chinese people. And, and some of them I'm really happy to see and some of them just don't know what to think. You know, they, they just, they have a big blank look on their face. And those ones worry me. I feel bad when you can't get a reaction out of somebody when they just, they just look right through you, they're blank. But some of them, you know, the little kids coming out and, and adults too, just coming up and really embracing it is just wonderful. It's wonderful. But the roads have turned into dirt roads again, and heavy rain has turned the dirt roads into mud. And while Steve makes friends in the mud, hey, he hasn't made friends with the mud. <laughs> Riding a hand cycle in the mud is really tough. It weighs a lot, it sinks down in the mud. Plus, I got three wheels on the ground I have to guide through this stuff. A regular bike only has two wheels on the ground and only has to find one line through it. Plus, I'm powering this thing with my arm. Join World Ride and see the world. Eventually, the mud becomes too thick to ride through. Our head Chinese guys are negotiating with the policemen to see if they can open this road for us. But right now, the word is, is they're going to keep the road closed until it dries up. And there's no options. We can't go on any other alternate routes. The team leaders decide to load the bicycles atop the vans and drive through the once dry riverbed. Unfortunately, the vans are no better equipped for muddy miles than the two- and three-wheel bikes. front-wheel drive of the hand cycles often leaves the riders spinning their wheels. Yeah, it's got to be the worst, some of the worst cycling we've had. You know, in the mud, kicking up on the bikes, slowing us down, having to stop here once in a while and clean the thing off. And to the very last mile of muddy road, there are crowds of curious Chinese, most of them having their first <laughs> amazed glimpse of America. That was a lot of fun. 
team reaches the Great Wall, last stop on the trek through China. The wall represents one of mankind's greatest achievements. The riders pause a moment to reflect on their own achievement. We have now passed through 15 different countries out of 16. We have one more country to go through, and that's uh, Japan. And then we will return to the States, and that'll be, that will be just absolutely fantastic. <laughs> a lot of miles have gone by. Steve Ackerman's body is covered with bumps and bruises. He can't even feel because of his paralysis. Unfortunately, he now has a new problem, something far worse. Well, I just took a look at Steve Ackerman this morning. He's developed a significant pressure sore on his bottom. Steve Ackerman has had continual strain on his buttocks for the last six months, and he can't feel the warning signals of pain. A pressure sore is the total deterioration of the skin tissue. It's one of the greatest fears of any paralyzed person. If from the medical perspective, the ideal situation is that he unloads this completely, so that means he doesn't ride. Even if he does ride, it's not going to be healed even by the time he gets to Washington, and I know that the next stage is a lot tougher. Steve has a choice. He can ride and risk serious long-term injury, or he can give up the dream of a lifetime. As World Ride arrives in Japan, Steve Ackerman decides that in spite of the danger to his health, he's going to keep on riding. It's really tough. It's really tough for me to decide that, um, what to do, you know? What Steve is experiencing is the one thing that we were worried about more than anything. They're all going to get the muscle strains. They're all going to get the tendonitis and the overuse things. But when the skin breaks down, we're left with some difficulty because it takes a very long time to heal. And if it breaks down significantly, again, it's infected, it goes down to the bone, and, and it just is, a, we're talking months to a year to heal if it really is bad. I know David spent some time on a gurney in a hospital because of a uh, pressure sore. That's when I broke my back with a pressure sore. I was in the hospital for six, five and a half months all together. The uh, pressure sore took longer to heal than my spine. I guess I'll just take a minute to say that what we just did with Steve now, we need to do more of. Uh, he's got a sore that's opened up on his bottom, and if we can assist him in moving him around, uh, as opposed to him trying to drag himself around, we may be able to heal that up before we get back to America. Day 187, September 19th. Kinokuni to Hikigawa, Japan. 72 miles. Exquisite cycling. Beautiful mountain roads made for bicycles. Narrow, twisting, with lots of ups and downs. I do love a good climb. Japan is like a bright light after months of groping in the darkness. What a change. The people have embraced us and greet us with open arms and open hearts. That is a eel, eel and also warm water trout. On one of many excursions, Steve saw a faith healer who tried to help his pressure sore. I could actually feel some energy traveling down into my lower extremity. Just really, really, uh, really relaxed. Still, despite doctor's orders, Steve cycled today, and he cycled well like the Steve I know. Unfortunately, though, late in the day he crashed, opening a not-quite-healed wound on his elbow. And I was right behind him, just saying, the hand cycle did, did a, you know, a hard swerve, and over he went after bumping a log. And he gets right back up, you know, does a little check and sees what's injured, and, you know, we. we Get the medication on the on the wounds and off they go again. Okay. All right. See if the bike works. Scrubs, bandages. I'll uh, stick pull you around. Yeah. Yeah. You got the gear. Excuse me. Get the, you get the gear. Heads up. Steve Ackerman rides on. He's aware of the long-term danger. 
But after 10,000 miles, 16 countries, and six months of riding, he cannot give up now. Finally, the team reaches the Pacific. They've pedaled their way from Ireland, across all of Europe, and all of Asia. It's time to come home. Steve, my heart goes out to him because of the level of his disability. If, 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 if it was me, I'd be, I'd be scared to even sit on my butt. You know, it's, uh, it's kind of, it's the kind of thing where you've got to, you've got to be extremely careful with it. Otherwise, you could end up uh, being in a hospital for several months. It's like we're all in this thing together at this point, and I would hate for anyone not to complete a trip, but for, particularly for a reason like a pressure sore. It feels great to be back in U.S. Yeah. Style. We're on the home stretch, only 3,000 miles to go. Can't wait to get to D.C. Everyone huddle up over here. Steve's got the word for the day. I was looking through the book, and I wanted to get something on uh, courage. Um, I think the most important part of courage is uh, how we give it to others, and, and that's in courage. And I think that's a big part of our mission is to encourage other people to do great things. And so I want everybody today to keep in mind and, and throughout this ride that our mission is to encourage other people to, to do great things uh, through our example of doing a great thing. So that's my word for today. Thank you. We keep saying, God, you know, we've done so much distance and all. We still have the USA, an entire, you know, cross a continent to do. So uh, we aren't home free yet. And the USA is going to have some tough times. Uh, it's great being back. America is the best country in the world. I've learned that from traveling through all, all those foreign countries. I've really learned to appreciate uh, the United States a whole lot more than I ever had before, particularly as a disabled person. Having circled the rest of the world, the team gets to see America last. The wide open spaces of Arizona and New Mexico are a welcome sight especially to a Westerner like Steve Ackerman. Steve is close to home and feeling much better. He was able to treat this the appropriate way, devote his time to getting this to heal, and when we got back to Los Angeles, it was already on its way to healing. It wasn't completely healed, and to my immense surprise, he has healed this wound going across America. Adam. <laughs> You know, I was thinking about just driving in from here, you know, and I got my car now for the first time. The miles are easier now for Steve, especially when he's riding alongside his son, Adam. Well, look what we're heading into, Adam. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> the amazing journey is nearly over, and the closer the ride gets to Washington, the more reflective and nostalgic the riders become. In Oklahoma, Rex Patrick returns to ride along for just a day. Just personally, I still miss him a lot. From the team perspective, I agree with what everybody else says. Things seem to be a lot lighter, a lot more fun, and a lot more of a, of a team effort. Hey, Rex. Good to see you. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? We got a short day today, I hear. Oh, a real short one. You came, you came back on the right day, Rex. If there's ever a day, we need you. It's been three and a half months since Rex was on the ride. In some ways, it's as if he never left. At the same time, his return emphasizes how far the riders have come as a team. 
it's it's amazing how this team has resilience. How we how everything came back into into play that we didn't have to stop. That the ride went on. The leaves are turning. The air is getting colder. The cyclists gather momentum like horses smelling the barn. The ride across the American Midwest becomes a kind of victory lap as people turn out to cheer what the riders have done. Disabled people nearing the finish line after riding their bicycles around the world. What was once impossible now seems inevitable. But one more big surprise awaits them. Snow, lots of it. After eight months on their bikes, even riding in the snow is natural. It seems like the thing to do. I mean, what else would I do? I've forgotten how to do anything else. I don't know engineering anymore. So Rory and his teammates ride on, pushing the boundaries of the possible and inspiring others to do the same. I reach out with my open hand. I reach out with my heart. I've been waiting, oh Lord, I've been praying for the journey to start. Is there a reason why I lost the use of my legs? I can't say that it was meant to be, but it has definitely uh, made me a better person. I was surviving, but I found that riding a bike, I'm not just surviving, I'm thriving. I've learned how to fly. Oh, I have learned how to fly. It's so easy to leave all my troubles behind. Because I, oh, I have learned how to fly. We've survived it, and we've come out better people, and we've, we've helped change a lot of lives, including our own. I've been touched by the mystery. I am part of the plan. I am touched by the child that I see inside every man, including me. As a child, I dreamt I could fly. Now my dreams are coming to life. Day 247, November 18th, Reston, Virginia to Washington, D.C., 18 miles. We made it. I have learned how to fly. Oh. long-lasting effects are really implanted that someone keeps remembering and drawing that. You know, it doesn't end here. It's going to continue. So I hope to, uh, you know, showing people what we did and hearing from other people what inspires them because I can always use some inspiration too. World Ride, the possible dream will continue. Yes, everybody The World Ride touched many lives in this world. Thousands of riders along the way, and millions who looked on on three continents. Some of them wondering, no doubt, as the caravan passed by, what does it all mean? What it means is that there are unexpected depths in human beings and abilities beyond the world's imagining. What it means is that we all ride the same road. And if we ride it together, we can get where we want to go. Happy Thanksgiving.
child with my heart I've been waiting, oh Lord, I've been praying For the journey to start Oh, there's a smile on my face I found my place in this world I spread my wings against the sky I have learned how to fly Oh, I have learned how to fly It's so easy to leave all my troubles behind Because I, oh, I have learned how to fly I am part of the plan I am touched by the child that I see Inside every man, including me As a child I dreamt I could fly Now my dreams are coming to life I spread my wings against the sky I have learned how to fly has been a Halcyon Days production. You are not your car, your house, your job, or your money. I'm not my clothes, my hair, my eyes, my arms or legs. We are our dreams, our desires, and our actions.